Welcome to One Mind Zen. Tonight's Dharma talk is given by Ron Kisen Stevenson. We celebrate the Buddha's birthday. And uh, at this time, it's probably a good time to consider what we really know about him and his original teachings. It's a question that we often contemplate. I'd like to share with you um, some of my perspectives and especially three sutras from the Pali collection that uh, have been particularly influential in my own practice. Um, I'd like to talk about, first of all, briefly about the Buddha himself. While he's idealized as a prince, the fact is he was actually the son of a ruler of a democratically run tribe not exactly a crown prince, not as lofty as the tradition often makes it. But then his teachings were also a little less lofty and a bit more pragmatic. And he also flatly denied being a god of some kind. So why the myth-making? Well, my premise is that we tend to idolize and mythologize our heroes. And yet the work of the path is far from the stuff of legends, as you know. Uh, for this reason, we call it a practice, not a religion, a philosophy, a belief system, but a practice, a very ordinary plotting practice. But why do we need a practice? Well, the Buddhist, in the Buddhist time, it's important to consider that there was no discipline of psychology. So people were naturally bewildered by their mental states. Also, there wasn't an advanced science of cosmology. So people believed in mythological notions. How much did the Buddha believe these things is another question. Um, society at the time was undergoing a revolution similar to the French Revolution. The revolt here was not against the Catholic Church, but the Brahmins. And uh, they had pretty much positioned themselves as the intercessor for all spiritual needs. And of course, people came to resent that, that authoritarianism. Those who were more traditional followed a new path that eventually became Hinduism, while Jainism and Buddhism arose as well. The tumult was so great that numerous people took to different teachers, including Gautama himself. Now, what the Buddha originally taught wasn't compiled into a system, so far as we know. What I mean by that is he never wrote a book. What we have are records of his speeches preserved in writing centuries later, uh, a large literary tradition of commentary, analysis, spanning centuries, and later literature that arose out of the practice, like the Zen Cohen collections of Wanyo and Korean Zen. Uh, we naturally try to trace back the earliest writings in search of the most authentic stuff, but while this is helpful, it's limited because even within this group of writings of the same period, there, there are internal contradictions. So what I would like to take is a more con uh, kind of contextual approach. Uh, what comes to focus for me is that there was a vital community of monks trying to carry on the Buddha's example and teachings after his death. In the course of which, of course, they would uh, obviously reflect socially conditioned premises about the world, nature, and the universe. Um, whether or not these can be attributed directly to the Buddha or to the scribes is something that's difficult to prove. But we do reach a point where we have to reconcile the internal contradictions and make some kind of judgment for ourselves on what is authentic or original and what's culturally adventitious or that is added on in the process of transmission. So the first principle I advocate or that I take is a pragmatic approach. 
The Buddha in the Pali Sutras is continually depicted as returning the conversation from the lofty and intellectual back to the practical and the inner focused. So whatever in Buddhist Sutra we take as a guide should be focused on our practice, not on some meandering, um, some meanderings of the discriminating mind, such as metaphysics, cosmology, and so forth. In fact, the Buddha turned these questions aside. Uh, but you may ask, well, how do we know that even these sutras are not adventitious? Uh, what if these were somehow added in? Well, uh, there, there are internal contradictions, so which are most authentic? So the second principle that I advocate is distinctiveness. How distinct or quintessential is a teaching from the dominant notions of the time? Uh, we know what those prevalent teachings were. People have a soul that continually gets reborn. There's a creator God with whom we, our soul ultimately reunites in Nirvana. Karma is a childishly simplistic, simple form of divine retribution. Prayer and supplication are rewarded. Bad deeds are punished. Humans are divided into classes according to their past karma. Women cannot become spiritually fulfilled unless they are a good enough servant of men to be reborn as a man. But what's interesting about the Pali Sutras is that the Buddha denied every one of these prevailing cultural uh, paradigms. So I would definitely pay particular attention to those sutras that seem to be distinct from their times. Of those, the first unsurprisingly, is the Kalama Sutra, which is, for me, probably the most intriguing of them all. The question posed was, well, is the teacher or doctrine to be believed? Which path? Which path do we follow? There are so many contradictory teachings. Um, and here's the answer. Kalamas, don't go by reports, by legends, by traditions, by scripture by logical conjecture, by inference, by analogies, by agreement through pondering views, by probability, or by the thought, this contemplative is our teacher. When you know for yourselves that these qualities are unskillful, these qualities are blameworthy, these qualities when adopted and carried out lead to harm and suffering, then you should abandon them. So here the Buddha formally rejects the authority of the teacher and school and places the burden of truth right back on the student. Well, thanks a lot. Thanks for nothing, I might say, uh, which brings to mind that aphorism that Zen promises nothing and delivers. So when you know for yourselves, what does that challenge really mean? Well, we need to cultivate insight. Zen develops this by focusing more on the question than on the answer. In fact, a koan is nothing but a questioning mind. And here is the basis for it. When you know for yourselves. Um, in the Pali, the Buddha advises us to be mindful of how we direct our attention. Focus on the sensations of the body. In Zen, focus on the breath. The Kula Vada Sutra. The shorter instructions to Malankya is the second one I would like to talk about. The Buddha first asks, um, did I ever say to you, come, live the holy life under me, and I will declare to you, the cosmos is eternal, or the cosmos is not eternal. The cosmos is finite, or the cosmos is infinite. The soul and body are the same, or they are different. The Tathagata exists after death or does not exist in it. No, Lord, you have never said that. So why not just answer the question? Well, here is where the famous simile of the poisoned arrow is brought up. It's just as if a man were wounded with an arrow thickly smeared with poison. His friends and companions would say, here's a surgeon to remove it. And the man would say, no, 
I won't have the arrow removed until I know all the facts. Who wounded me? Was it a noble warrior? Was it a Brahmin? Was it a merchant, a worker? Uh, what was his given name and claim? And on and on. The paragraph goes on to about 15 lines. Well, in the same way, if anyone were to say, I won't live the holy life under the blessed one, as long as he does not declare to me that the universe is, or the cosmos is eternal, or that a Tathagata neither exists nor does not exist, that man would die. And those things would still remain undeclared by the Tathagata. The Buddha is just as crafty as Jesus here when Jesus said, render unto Caesar what is his. Here's another of his crafty answers from the Apanaka Sutta, which is called a safe bet. The Buddha is asked about rebirth first. Some contemplatives say that there's no total sensation of becoming. And some speak in opposition to this, saying there is total cessation of becoming. So what are we to think? Well, first of all, he states that these things are either unknown or unknowable. So we must not be seduced by any of these views. An observant person considers thus. As for those venerable contemplatives who hold this view, there's no total sensation of becoming. I haven't seen that. As for those venerable contemplatives who hold the view, there is total cessation of becoming. I haven't seen that either. Oh, well, so if I were to take one side, and declare only this is true. Anything else is worthless. That would not be fitting for me. Well then. So how do we act with such conflicting information? Um, here the Buddha takes. An extremely pragmatic turn. Make a safe bet. As for those. Contemplatives who hold this view, there is no total cessation of becoming. If their statement is true, there's the safe bet possibility that I might appear among the perception made devas of no form. As for those venerable contemplators and Brahmins who hold uh, this doctrine, this view, there is total cessation of becoming. If that's true, it's possible that I will be totally unbound in the here and now. For those who hold the doctrine that there is no total sensation of becoming. This borders on passion and fetters. As for those who hold the view there is total cessation of becoming, it borders on non-passion, non-fettering, non-relishing, non-grasping, non-clinging. So reflecting thus, he practices disenchantment toward becoming, for dispassion towards becomings and cessation of becomings. So what's interesting here is that if we act as though each of these possibilities or probabilities simultaneously exist, almost like the multi multiple universe theory, we can take life lessons from each. We can't know whether there's an afterlife or not, whether there's rebirth, but we are wise to act as though our actions have consequences beyond us, nonetheless. We can't know if there's a cessation of rebirth, but if we act as though that possibility exists, we will be more inclined to stop clinging to desire for rebirth. What a crafty answer, isn't it? This craftiness is one of the defining characteristics of the Buddha that I see in these Pali Sutras. So anytime that someone tries to justify a belief as Buddhist, just because it's stated in one of the 10,000 texts of Buddhism, my response would be, yeah, which Buddha is that? Is it the Buddha of the Lotus Sutra who puffed himself up into a godlike figure? Is it the Buddha who parrots the typical conventional pieties of his day? Um, and we know what those are. I've gone over it. People have a soul that continually gets reborn, etc. Or is it the Buddha who denied every one of these prevailing cultural paradigms and said instead that wisdom 
and morality flow from within through practice rather than being imposed from without by scripture. So in conclusion, or my conclusion, is that the Buddha left us a very poor body of dogma. In his most authentic sounding sutras to me, he devours dogma and he spits out practice. The Buddha wasn't one to put the cart before the horse. Every time a student indicated to him some attachment to result, he returned the discussion back to practice and intent. And this for me is the authentic Buddha. Thank you.